This is the Camtasia recording of Disorders of the Lower GI Tract, Part 2. We'll talk about diarrhea, constipation, abdominal pain, and irritable bowel syndrome. Diarrhea, in and of itself, is not a diagnosis. It's a symptom of a diagnosis. It is anything that is a variation from what's normal, typically considered at least three or loose or liquid stools a day. Um, it can be acute or it can be chronic. If it's longer than four weeks duration, it's considered a chronic diarrhea, and we'll talk about some things that have chronic diarrhea associated with them. It's usually caused by either decreased fluid absorption in the bowel, so there's more fluid in the bowel to pass on out of there. Increased fluid secretion into the bowel, so there's more fluid to pass on out of there. Or an increased motility, an increased peristalsis, which sends the the GI contents on through fast enough where the fluid is not reabsorbed back into the system, so they have increased liquid stools. Um, infectious organisms is the primary cause of acute diarrhea, viral, bacterial, parasitic. There are some medications that can cause diarrhea along with some altered um, absorption syndromes that cause diarrhea. Clinical manifestations of diarrhea that you worry about are dehydration and electrolyte problems. The patient has abdominal cramping, skin irritation, of course, at the rectum. It can be associated with nausea and vomiting. It can be associated with blood or mucus or white blood cells in the stool. But what we are concerned about with regard to um, real problems that come from diarrhea are the dehydration and the electrolyte disturbances. Diagnostic testing associated with diarrhea. A history is real important. A history of taking antibiotics, many antibiotics can cause diarrhea, some of them more severely than others. People that travel may have gotten it con into contaminated food or water can, can be a diagnostic of what kind of diarrhea they have. Certain medications cause diarrhea. If a patient's contact, their roommates, their family has had diarrhea in the past couple of weeks, that makes you wonder if it's a viral or a bacterial, something they've gotten into. Also, with regard to diagnostic tests, you may check a CBC. If it's a bacterial problem, they may have an elevated white blood cell count. If they're dehydrated, they may have an elevated H&H. &H. Electrolytes, you would need to check those, looking for, for um, certain electrolyte disturbances that can go along with losing too much of the bowel contents, potassium, low potassium, that kind of thing. You actually can send a stool to the lab for examination for blood, mucus, white blood cells, parasites. And we'll talk about some of that. Some infectious organisms that can cause diarrhea, examples of this. E. coli is something that you hear about. Typically, you find E. coli is... Um, comes from contaminated raw food. E. coli is a normal, a normal bacteria in your bowel, but there are pathological strains that can cause diarrhea so badly that it, I mean, people can die from it, dehydrate and die from it. So um, if some of those pathological strains get onto food or in beef, a lot of times beef you think about when they slaughter cows, if they nick the bowel, the E. coli in the bowel can get out into the beef. Or with raw food, if there's not good hand washing used and somebody has E. coli on their hands because they have, you know, a diarrhea problem and it gets on the raw food, then it can be spread in the, in the food supply. There is um, in the news this week actually an outbreak in Germany that they're blaming on bean sprouts. Okay. So salmonella is something that you hear about people getting in the hospital because they're dehydrated, because they've got salmonella poisoning, and that comes from a lot of times undercooked pork, eggs, or chicken. Um, giardia, lamblia, is in contaminated lakes or pools. You can get either drinking the water or ingesting the water when you're swimming. Some kinds of viruses can cause diarrhea. Usually they're self-limiting, and there's really only so much you do with regard to taking care of them. Um, you just watch fluid and electrolytes and hydration and that kind of thing. But you have to remember that viruses are very contagious, and they can be contagious for up to two weeks. Usually this, this stuff is spread fecal oral. These viruses are spread fecal oral, so it's important that you um, be aware of hand washing and those kind of things. 
So what about C. diff? You hear a lot about C. diff in the hospital. That's because C. diff is something that's considered a nosocomial infection. It's something that's spread in a healthcare setting, either in the hospital or in the nursing home. Usually comes from the use of clindamycin, which is an antibiotic. It's a bacteria that actually grows, overgrows in the bowel and sets up a, a, a membrane. It's called pseudomembranous barrier. It forms in the bowel that keeps the fluids from absorbing back into the bowel tissue. So it causes diarrhea because there's so much fluid kept in the bowel by this pseudomembranous membrane. That's called pseudomembranous colitis when it sets up that membrane. It can actually cause, possibly cause a toxic megacolon, which is a bowel that's so inflamed and has so many um, swelling issues that the circulation gets cut off, it gets infected, it gets gangrenous, and people actually can die from toxic megacolon. So C. diff is a very big deal. You see a lot about it in the hospital because it is nosocomial and because it is spread in the hospital. And so um, they're real funny about hand washing, hand washing, hand washing with regard to C. diff. But there's a reason because these people can get really sick and these people can die. It's treated with vancomycin or flagell, typically antimicrobials. It is a spore. So the alcohol type things don't work with C. diff. You have to wash your hands and you have to scrub them good. Friction is what gets C. diff off of your hands. Rotavirus. You hear about rotavirus a lot with regard to daycare situations and children that spread this, this little GI virus. Causes diarrhea. It's not a little GI virus. Causes diarrhea and can cause um, dehydrating diarrhea in children and infants. Children and infants and old people dehydrate much more easily than the rest of us. So this is a very big concern. It is fecal oral in a situation where there are diapers being changed and then food being handed out and things like that. That's how these things get spread. Typically they treat it symptomatically with hydration and electrolytes. It's very important with these, these kids to make sure they don't get dehydrated. Oven parasites is also something that can cause diarrhea. Sometimes you'll have a, a, um, an order for a stool for culture insensitivity and a stool for ONP. The culture insensitivity is trying to figure out what bacteria is growing in there, so they culture that out and what kind of drugs it's sensitive to. But then the ONP is looking for ovine parasites, and these are some of the ovine parasites that you might see on this list here. Um, Giardia being the one that most commonly I think about, but it comes from being exposed to contaminated water, once again, either through drinking it or swimming in it and being ingesting it or whatever. But traveling puts you at risk for this, so that's why we need to ask our patients about traveling. This travel agent says, in the event you suffer from Montezuma's Revenge, there's a TV in every bathroom. So I guess that's supposed to be a selling point. Montezuma's Revenge is not any particular type of bacteria. It is um, something that is a traveler's diarrhea, basically, is what it is. Other things that can cause diarrhea, more, more of the chronic diarrhea is than the acute food intolerances, um, like lactulose intolerance. People that um, are lack the lactase enzyme can have problems when they drink milk products. Celiac disease is a malabsorption problem that can cause chronic diarrhea. And short bowel syndrome, we'll talk about that. That is people that have difficulties because they've had some of their bowel resected and they don't have the absorption, and so they have a lot of diarrhea with it, like chronic diarrhea. Collaborative care, treat the cause, treat the fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Using antibiotics is usually pretty rare unless they have a specific culture that's grown that they know that this bug is sensitive to this antibiotic. Antidiarrheals, typically you don't use them initially because if it's a, a, a virus or bacteria in there that needs to come on out, it needs to come on out and it will prolong the issue if you give an antidiarrheal. You may need to let it run its course. Typically, they don't use antidiarrheals for more than 48 hours anyway. It can cause problems in and of itself to give antidiarrheals. So they don't, cause, don't, don't like to use antidiarrheals for more than 48 hours. And truly, if it's something that's running, that's a problem that's been going on for more than 48 hours, it may need further attention anyway. Nutritional therapy that goes along with diarrhea. Pinulite or Gatorade is good for electrolyte replacement. Typically, we put them on clear liquids, advance them to a little bit um, more, you know, more of the, the, the not clear liquids onto a bland diet after about the first 24 hours. Hydration is the biggest thing. Um, just slowly progressing them to foods that they can tolerate. 
patient teaching, once again, there's the hand washing, how to handle food, make sure that your food does not get contaminated, how to make sure your food stays refrigerated so stuff doesn't grow in the food, and then infection control with regard to if they live in a household with somebody that has the virus, washing hands, washing down the bathroom, washing doorknobs, those kind of things to make sure that those things don't get spread. This chicken says, that used to be called an obsessive compulsive behavior, and now it's ordinary behavior on the hand washing, which I think is true. Some of the antidiarrheals we give are anticholinergics. Remember we talked about the cholinergic stimulation is uh, increases motility. Anticholinergic drugs decreases motility. It dries things up, slows things down. This would be things like atropine or lecithin. Absorbents. These type of antidiarrheals actually coat the walls of the GI tract to absorb the bacteria and the toxins and pass them on out with a stool. Pepto-bismol, kaopectate, sometimes activated charcoal can be used. Things that actually modify the intestinal flora that repopulate the, the GI tract with good bacteria that help fight the diarrhea causing bacteria are called probiotics. Lactobacillus is a real common one that you hear about. It's in some yogurts and that kind of thing. Um, but it helps supply that missing bacteria and helps suppress the growth of the diarrhea causing bacteria. Lactinex is another one that you hear of. We get Fluorinex at the hospital. It actually repopulates the lactobacillus. Opiates decrease the motility of the bowel. They, de they reduce the pain associated with rectum spasms. They actually slow things down. They slow the transit time. They, um, because they slow the transit time, they actually increase the absorption back into the, in the bowel wall, back into the body of the liquid part of the stool because they slow things down. That's the imodium and the lamodal. Things need to worry about with some of these. Some of the absorptions actually contain aspirin. You need to think about somebody that doesn't need aspirin, somebody that's got bleeding issues, somebody that's like a child, puts them at risk for a syndrome. Um, these absorbents can cause constipation if they're not taken responsibly. can be dark stools. The hearing loss and tinnitus would be from the aspirin, black gums and, and I mean, blue gums and a black tongue. The anticholinergics, which slow things down in the GI tract, also slow things down in the GU tract, so be aware they can have urinary retention. Hesitancy, which is hard time getting the urinary tract, I mean the urinary stream started, and then impotence. They can get headache and confusion and anxiety and drowsiness and things like that from anticholinergics. Certainly dry skin, dry mouth. Um, flushing can come from anticholinergics. These people can get blurred vision. The anticholinergics can cause base, uh, pupillary dilation, so um, which increases intraocular pressure, and we'll talk about some of that when you get into your sensory lecture. But so you have to be aware of your patients that have like glaucoma, and do they need to get things like atrophy? And then the opiates, these are the, of course, the narcotic type things that can cause drowsiness, sedation, and lethargy. They can cause nausea and vomiting. And they actually can cause constipation. They can slow the GI tract down enough to cause constipation. Respiratory depression, of course, is always an issue with any kind of opiates. And then, once again, the urinary retention and those kind of things, and CNS depression. So anytime you think about narcotics or opiates, you think about those kind of things. These are just some little cartoons um, with regard to the ammonium and the lamodal. It just tells, talks about if the diarrhea seems to hit you when you're out of town, when Mother Nature calls, it's always the wrong number, then it's time to take ammonium or lamodal. And it gives you a list of the GI problems, sedation, GI discomfort, and constipation. Don't take for longer than 48 hours. Constipation, once again, alone is, is just a symptom. It's not a diagnosis. Your patient doesn't come in. They're constipated. What they come in with is another pathology that's causing constipation. It is a variation from what's normal for the, this patient. Be aware that some people go every day, and if they don't go every day, they believe themselves to be constipated. Some people only go every three days, and that's normal for them. So you just have to be aware of that. What causes the constipation? Decreased fiber and fluids, typically. If they're not eating right, if they're not drinking enough fluid. There are some medications that cause constipation. There are some neurogenic problems that cause constipation. There's some musculoskeletal, I mean, um, neuromuscular issues that have GI symptoms associated with it. There are endocrine issues like diabetes that have gastroparesis, which is a, a decreased peristalsis um, associated with it. And then there's some lifestyle things like 
patients that don't want to go to the bathroom if they are outside of their home setting, patients that don't get enough exercise that end up not um, not getting you know the, the exercise stimulation to the bowel, people that ignore the defecation urge to go because they have psychological issues with it or whatever. There's a lot of things that can cause diarrhea, I mean, cause constipation, I'm sorry. Clinical manifestations of diarrhea, I mean, to constipation. <laughs> um, hard, dry, difficult to pass stools, abdominal extension, bloating, flatulence, rectal pressure, hemorrhoids. We'll talk about hemorrhoids. Y'all know um, the complaints that, that patients have with constipation. Diagnostic studies include physical exam, back to the physical exam of the belly we talked about. History is important. Also, they could have a very minima looking for um, obstructions, strictures, that kind of thing. Collaborative care involves giving the patient enough fluid, enough fiber, enough exercise. Being very careful about laxatives because laxatives can cause dependence. Your bowel actually gets where it's atonic. It doesn't have good tone. It doesn't respond to that intrinsic nerve stimulation that says the bowel's full. We need to you know, contract and cause a bowel movement. Um, your bowel can actually get where it doesn't respond to that. So the, the daily bulk forming stuff, like the Metamucil and stuff like that, is a little better to use than things like the Dulcolax and things like that. They usually don't recommend using those on a regular basis, the Dulcolax and that kind of thing. Nutritional therapy, two to three liters of fluid a day is what they're recommending. Obviously, there's some patients that can't take in that kind of volume because of other health problems. But two to three liters a day to keep your bowel healthy and going. Plus 20, I think it's 20 to 30 grams of fiber. A lot of fiber will keep the bowels going. Preventing constipation, exercise fiber fluids, minimize laxatives, positioning. Patient needs to be sitting up to go to the bathroom and squatting actually is the way the body's made, that that's the natural position of going to the bathroom. So make sure they're at least sitting up on the commode or up on the bedpan if at all possible to help them go. Keep them regular if they always go to the bathroom every morning after their coffee. Try to keep that that routine if you can and don't delay them going to the bathroom and don't let them hold it because it once again it'll set up in there and the fluid will absorb back into the system and, and it'll become more and more constipated so don't delay going when they need to go. This is just a picture of a barium enema. The barium liquid is actually put into the large intestine through the anus and it goes up through the sigmoid through the through the ascending, I mean the descending, the transverse, and then the ascending colon. You can see on the picture the radiological view of it, the actual loops of bowel, and that's how they can see is there an obstruction, is there a narrow place, is there a stricture, what's going on, is there a place where the barium won't go through, whatever, that's what they're looking for. After somebody has a barium in it, it's important to make sure they take their laxative to get this barium out because it is sort of a chalky substance which can set up in there and cause constipation. Laxatives you may see given, the bulk forming laxatives, the metamucil and citrus cell, these are basically fibery type things that absorbs more water into the bowel, distending the bowel to initiate the reflex bowel activity. The colates, mineral oil, docolites are stool softeners. They promote more, more water and fat into the stools and sort of lubricate it. The hyperosmolar laxatives like go lightly, lactulose, sorbitol, glycerin, they actually increase the water content of the feces because it pulls osmotically from the, the, the through the bowel wall into um, into the system which causes distension in the peristalsis and then the evacuation. You see a lot of go lightly given for diagnostic tests and that kind of thing. Lactulose, sometimes we would give that when we gave like charcoal down in the ER to make it move on through. Saline also creates a hyperosmotic environment because of the electrolytes, the magnesium citrate, mag sulfa, um, milk of magnesia, fleet cinemas. Those are things that actually have an osmotic pull because of the electrolytes involved in those medications. And then the stimulants, which actually increase the peristalsis, the nerve stimulation, are the exlax and the docolax and the synecot. Things we need to worry about with, the, with some of these, the bulk forming, 
Um, they use them for acute constipation or irritable bowel or diverticulosis to try and help manage those symptoms, but they can actually cause in fact impaction and or fluid overload if your patient's not careful. If they don't get enough fluid or they get too much fluid. The emollients you typically see given more for acute constipation. Um, somebody that's got maybe they've had hemorrhoid surgery and they need to have help with taking something to make it softer so they'll go on and start going. These things can cause, however, skin rashes if, the, if they have, the skin has more exposure to the bowel um, contents, plus decreased absorption of fat-soluble vitamins because it increases the fat in the stool and there's less absorption and more, more excretion of those fatty type things. Hyperous molar laxatives that go lightly, they'll give a lot of times for diagnostic and surgical clips. This can, it can cause abdominal bloating, and there's a lot of stool associated with it, a lot of watery stool associated with it, so there can be a lot of rectal irritation with regard to that. And that's actually pretty common in the hospital. When you have patients that are on these, they may get irritated back there, and you may have to get them something to put around their rectum for skin protection. The saline-type laxatives that they... Um, may give for constipation, but also for diagnostic preps or removal of when they warm somebody, basically is what the, the anthelmintics and the parasites, if you give somebody worm medicine and then you have to give them something to get the worms on out, this is what they give. What you worry about with regard to these is the electrolyte content and is the patient okay to take that a highly concentrated electrolyte like magnesium. On um, people that are renal patients, you have to be careful about things like fleet cinemas and things like that. And in fact, we don't give fleet cinemas to our renal patients these days Alabama for that reason, because of the electrolytes. The stimulants, the Exlax, the, the Cinecot, the Dulcolax, they're good for acute constipation short term or from diagnostic tests. You do have to worry about um, malabsorption of nutrients in the long term, though, and skin rashes and, and irritation and rectal irritation and stimulation. So they're not good for long term. They just use those for short term. A little cartoon about milk and magnesia, MOM and AM for BM and BM. And also you can use milk and magnesia for upper GI burning and things like that. You have to watch for cramping diarrhea and dehydration with milk and magnesia. And this is Cody. We're supposed to remember that Biscadil, because of the Cody in the middle of the word, helps us with um, cleaning out our bowels, I guess, because like that's what he's about to do. The side effects of Biscadil are um, watch for fluid and electrolyte imbalance, abdominal discomfort, loss of potassium, and cramping. Metamucil, this is one of the bulk forming agents. You can see it coming in from the small bottle into the cecum there where the little filler with the water is. Get plenty of water in there. It gets thick and hard as a brick if there's not enough water in there. And then it moves on around to the transverse colon where it begins to form the fecal product and then on into the descending colon where it smooths it out. And then it gets into down into the sigmoid and the rectal colon where it causes enough bulk where it stimulates the um, the GI system to try to, to evacuate it. And then the guy at the bottom gets very excited, says it, yeah, it forms it and moves it on out. So anyway, that's not an useful. You can look at that. Okay, that's diarrhea and constipation. Next we'll talk about abdominal pain. First there's acute abdominal pain. Acute abdominal pain comes from lots of different things. It's not, once again, it's just a symptom. It's not a specific diagnosis, it's a symptom. It can be a symptom of inflammatory processes in the abdomen, vascular problems, gynecological problems, infections, obstruction, GI bleed, trauma. It can be a symptom of any of those things. The most common presenting symptom of abdominal pain is pain. Um, there may be other symptoms associated with it, abdominal tenderness, so you have to be sure and assess for that. Nausea and vomiting, constipation, diarrhea, flatulence, fatigue, fever, Swelling of the belly, these are things, some things we need to ask our patient about if they have acute abdominal pain. It can be diffuse or localized, dull, burning, or sharp. We just need to decide from the patient how he describes it. Need to assess for rebound tenderness. That's the tenderness that actually when you press on the stomach, it's not as painful as when you let go and it rebounds out, and that's called rebound tenderness. That's usually an indication of, of some sort of peritonitis or some sort of acute abdomen, maybe a surgical emergency in that situation. We need to assess for abdominal distension. You may have to measure girth on these people from day to day. 
abdominal rigidity. If the belly is flat and hard, uh, or even distended and hard, that and it's new for the patient or it's unusual for the patient, that may indicate there's an inflammatory process going on in there. Emetoemesis is vomiting blood, or melanin is blood in the stool. Those are both signs that we need to be aware of. Diagnostic studies that go along with, with acute abdominal pain. Once again, the complete history and physical, that's important to get the information um, that we've talked about on some of these other problems because it helps you kind of decide what's going on. The MD will do a rectal exam and a pelvic exam. Um, pretty much anybody that's got a lower abdominal pain, probably, will, if it's a female, will probably get a pelvic exam because it could be a gynecological thing. They'll hemocult stools when they do those kind of things. See if there's blood in the stool, even on occult blood in the stool. Labs, CBC may indicate um, bacterial infection with an elevated WBC, may indicate dehydration with a low H and H. A urinalysis may be indicative of a urinary tract infection. Abdominal x-ray is a flattened upright abdominal x-ray. is a non-invasive, just straight shot of the abdomen that could show, um, could show fluid levels, could show air, those kind of things. So a lot of times they'll do a flattened upright abdominal. Sometimes you can actually see little stones, like little gallstones and that kind of thing. Not very often, but sometimes you can. An EKG is an important diagnostic study on anybody that has pain from the nose to the navel. EKG possibly um, needs to be done because of the potential for it being cardiac related. HCG is a pregnancy test. If they're a female, they need a, at least a qualitative, which means either a yes or no, either they're pregnant or they're not pregnant, positive or negative. And then a quantitative, if they do find out they're pregnant, then a quantitative is actually a number that it assigns to how much HCG is in the system. The goal with acute abdominal pain is to identify and treat the cause. Do we need to give them pain medicine? Do we not need to give them pain medicine? There was a time when we didn't give pain medicine to abdominal pain because it was thought to mask the symptoms and we needed to evaluate what was going on before we could treat them for pain. Now you give Toradol, uh, which is an anti-inflammatory. It doesn't have the same side effects uh, for sedation and whatnot as um, as some of the narcotics, so you may see Toradol given more for abdominal pain, especially if it's an, an inflammatory abdominal pain. Toradol is a very good drug and it will help them a lot. Sometimes they'll have to go for an exploratory laparotomy to see what's going on, or an exploratory diagnostic laparoscopy, which is actually with a scope. Um, it just depends on the surgeon or the physician and you know the different situation and what they think needs to be done about it. But sometimes they'll take them off to surgery, sometimes they'll just wait and see. This is just an example of a quantitative HCG. Someone that is, say, for instance, five weeks pregnant and you get a, a quantitative HCG, you can see that that's a very, very broad uh, threshold of what's normal range of what's normal. So that really doesn't tell you anything except that you'll get, check it again in two or three days or a week and it should double or triple every two or three days. If it's not going up, then you worry that the pregnancy is, uh, is having problems. So it's not really like you could get a one-time quantitative HCG and know exactly how pregnant somebody is right now, but it will tell you whether it's a healthy pregnancy that's progressing depending on how fast it's going up. Or if it's dropping down, then you worry that it's, um, you worry that it's you know, you're having problems, they're losing the baby. So, this is a picture of a flattened upright abdomen. This is just showing some of the air bubbles you can see in the bowel. Uh, like I said, sometimes you can see stones, you can see, there's, it's not as diagnostic as a CT scan or an ultrasound, but it does help and it's, it's it, non-invasive and, and not terribly expensive. CDC, once again, the important thing we're really looking for with regard to, to abdominal pain, one of the important things is the white right blood cell count. The differential on the white blood cell count will show you um, what type of neutrophils are there. If the WBC count is elevated, they'll do a differential, and it shows you what kind of white blood cell cells are in there. The, the banded neutrophils are the new baby white blood cells that are being put out to fight a new infection, so the bands is what we're looking for to be elevated in a new acute infection. The segmented neutrophils are the SEGs. They've been out there for a while in, a, in an infection that's resolving or not quite as acute. You may have an elevation in those. Acinophils is typically more of an allergic type problem. You'll have elevated acinophils. The lymphocytes, often with viral problems, you'll have 
or by the lymphocytes, and then the monocytes are sort of later on in an infection. They're the macrophages that come in and try and clean things up. So if they're elevated, it may be that um, there's a, a more of a chronic infection or a longer-term infection. Your analysis can indicate infections. Diabetes, certainly they would be spilling, spilling sugar in their urine if they were diabetic. Malnutrition, renal disease, or dehydration are things that you can see from a urinalysis. So it's important in not just this lecture but all your lectures that you know how to collect a urinalysis. So review those things. How do you collect a, a regular random urinalysis? How do you collect a 24-hour uh, urine? Those kind of things because you may need to know that kind of stuff. Um, with the acute abdomen, you need to get a detailed history, including the details in the pain, because the, how the pain progresses and the pattern of the pain is very important in an acute abdomen. Need immediate vital signs. The immediate vital signs will certainly show you something about the volume status, inflammation or infection. If their blood pressure is low, it may be that they're dehydrated. If their um, temperature is high, it certainly could mean they have an infection. Inspect the belly for distension, masses, pulsations, scars, color changes, those kinds of things. And we'll talk about some of those things as the lecture progresses. Certainly, um, auscultate for hyperactive bowel sounds, me, or hypoactive bowel sounds, or what's normal. Make sure you all know what are normal, usually 5 to 30. Usually, they're um, sort of high-pitched and tinkly, not really, really high-pitched. but that they should be um, 5 to 30 times a minute. Remember, you listen for 2 to 5 minutes. And then after you listen, you palpate. Remember, you have to be gentle, be, be looking for tenderness. This is your pain assessment. This is just sort of a flashback to physical assessment class. But with, with pain assessment, be sure you ask, where is the pain? What, when did it start? What was the onset? Was it sudden or gradual? What's it like, the character of the pain? Does it radiate anywhere? Are there associated signs and symptoms? Um, does it follow any pattern as far as time courses, before meals, after meals? What makes it better? What makes it worse? And how severe is it on a scale of 1 to 10? So that all, the mnemonic that goes along with that particular um, way of looking at pain is Socrates. That's the S-O-C-R-A-T-E-S. Some people use PQRST, some people use, you know, people use different things. But that's, just remember that it's important when you're, you just don't want to know, I've got pain. You want to know, where is your pain? When did it start? What's it like? Does it go anywhere else? Do you have any other symptoms with it? You know, what makes it worse? What makes it better? Those kind of things. How severe is it on a scale of 1 to 10? Um, pain assessment is, is real important right now in nursing. It's in some important that we do. This is just a slide that I put in here so you can get a feel for what causes pain where. And you certainly, this is out of the book, you certainly don't have to memorize this, but just be aware that pain in the right upper quadrant a lot of times will be, um, will be biliary pain, liver problems, that kind of thing. Left upper quadrant a lot of times is your stomach or your spleen. Right lower quadrant is where you get into the appendicitis. Syndicitis problems. The left lower quadrant a lot of times is viral. It's like a diverticulitis or something like that. Diffusely, you can have pain from pancreatitis, and there's a whole list of things there that can cause diffuse abdominal pain. And then lower abdominal pain can be anything from, from um, you know, cystitis, endometriosis, GI kind of things, to, to bladder things, to um, you know, those kind of things. So you can look at that list and say, and we'll, we'll hop, talk very specifically about some things in this lecture that we're talking about. But in general, that is some of the places that you see abdominal pain. This has to do with referred abdominal pain. Remember that anything that aggravates your diaphragm, the um, liver, the gallbladder, the uh, gallbladder in particular with cholecystitis we think about, or the duodenum, may reflect as right upper right shoulder pain because of the way the nerves run. The pancreas pain can be in the front and epigastric area but also can go through to the back. Appendix pain may start around the belly button but go down to the right lower quadrant. Um, your gallbladder can be right over the gallbladder or it can radiate around to your flank, up and around your shoulder blade and your flank on that right side. So just be aware that it's not only just where where the organ is that might hurt. It might, because of the way the, the nerves run, it may actually come across as referred pain. 
nursing care of these people having belly pain, fluid and electrolyte replacement, pain management, pre and post-op care if they end up having to go for an exploratory laparotomy. A lot of times they'll have an NG tube when they come back. They'll have an NPO. You need to be sure, giving these people mouth care, maintaining that NG suction, making sure it's working, managing nausea and vomiting, ambulating them early to promote GI motility, and other prevent other post-op complications. This would be the turn cough and deep breath to prevent pneumonia. This would be the mobility and the STD hose and that kind of thing to provoke STDs to um, promote to prevent um, DVTs. Those kind of things. I've got too many initials going on in my head right now. I'm sorry. They'll start on clear liquids and progress. Once they're NPO and then they take out the NG tube, then they'll start on clear liquids and they'll progress and be aware of what you need to do with regard to discharge teaching. And when we get into very specific pathologies, you'll know what that is. So, the goal of acute abdominal pain, resolve the inflammation, relieve the abdominal pain, keep them free of complications. We talked about some of those. And then keep them in the normal nutritional status and the fluid and electrolyte balance. And that's your acute abdominal pain. Your chronic abdominal pain can originate from can originate from structures or be referred from somewhere else. Chronic abdominal pain can be from um, inflammatory bowel disease, peptic ulcer disease, diverticulitis, pancreatitis, any of the itises in the abdomen, the the hepatitis, cholecystitis, that's your liver and your gallbladder being inflamed. PID is an inflammatory process, pelvic inflammatory disease. Necrotic bowel, that's your folks that have um, vascular insufficiencies of their mesenteric artery. They have maybe sclerosis of the mesenteric artery or a clot, and then they can cause necrosis problems to their bowel. Once again, it's important to do a physical exam and get a good history on these people. Testing with chronic abdominal pain may involve a CT scan, an MRI may involve a laparoscopy where they actually take a scope and go in and look. may involve barium studies we've talked about. One of the chronic pain um, syndromes that you probably will see quite often is irritable bowel syndrome. It is a bowel pain, an abdominal pain that's intermittent and recurrent and is associated with either diarrhea or constipation or both. Usually people have more diarrhea or more constipation one way or another. About 20% of the population is affected, more women than men. There is a stress component to it. That doesn't mean it's all in their head, but it does mean the stress can make it worse. There are some psychological and food intolerance um, things factors that are associated with it too. The problem with irritable bowel syndrome is that it's not a very specific thing as far as physical findings go, and it's not a very specific thing as far as diagnostic testing go. It's more based on symptoms and try the medicines and see if it helps kind of a thing. So that can be frustrating for the patient because it's, it's a very uncomfortable, sometimes life-controlling diagnosis. And it's frustrating for them because there's not anything very specific that you can say, okay, this is what it is because we saw this piece of lab work or whatever. A lot of times they'll rule out other stuff. If there's rectal bleeding or fever or whatever, then obviously there's things that need to be ruled out that could cause those that are dangerous and life-threatening. And they'll rule those things out. But for the most part, there's not a diagnostic test associated with irritable bowel syndrome. What they do for these people is put them on um, a good fiber dosage for the day, 20 grams of fiber a day is what they recommend, maybe on something like metamucil or psyllium. They put them on anticholinergics to try and slow down the GI motility and slow down the cramping. There's one called Bentil that you'll see used a lot with belly pain patients to get it before meal. It helps dry things up and to manage the pain, the cramping, the spasmodic cramping. They may prescribe them either Lotronex or Midiza. The Lotronex is more for people that have the diarrhea type of irritable bowel. The Midiza is more constipation type of irritable bowel. May teach them relaxation and stress management techniques. Acupuncture, there's actually some information out there right now about acupuncture, acupressures and how they work, some herbal therapies. Not, there's no single therapy that they can say this is concretely going to help everybody every time. It has to be individualized. So it's something you have to think about. They may try this medicine, try that medicine. 
Once again, here's the drugs. The Bintil is the anticholinergic that decreases the GI motility and the secretions and relieves the spasm. The Lotronex is with the diarrhea um, type irritable bowel. It's used in women only. They haven't proven it safe for men. They have had some problems with it causing some of the, the ischemic colitis type problems that I talked about with the toxic megacolon. And so they took it off the market for a little while and now it's back on but very carefully regulated. The Amidiza, once again, is primarily, is they use it only in women. Now, I don't know why it only uses, it only works in women and not men. I don't really don't know the answer to that. But the Amidiza is women with the const, more the constipation symptom that goes along with irritable bowel. So anyway, it's just something to think about. There's a couple of good downloads on Evolve if you have. You bought one of the books that has the code that goes with it. Um, it downloads into your iPod on irritable bowel and on inflammatory bowel disease, and they're good to listen to in the car or whatever, you know, when you're, when you're doing your life and you want to multitask. So, questions about that? Um, of course, we're on Camtasia, so I can't ask you if you have questions about that. But I like the cat, so I left it in here. If you're over 40, you'll see this kitty as John Lennon. If you're under 40, you'll see this kitty as Harry Potter. <laughs> Isn't he cute? And that's all about that.